Today on Ag Etc., we have another new technology feature for you. Kyle Bauer is joined by Darren Unruh, who is a board member at Kaufman Seeds. They talk to us about the history of cover crops and how they combine cover crops to create the right product for the customer. So enjoy this extended series on technology on today's show. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine. Your stem cells, your health, your life. My name is Darren Unruh. I work at Kaufman Seeds and my primary job there is to put together cover crops, uh, blends, forage blends, straight cover crop blends and everything. I thought I'd go through just briefly about um, the history of the cover crops. This is nothing new. I mean, even back in the Roman Empire days, the Romans and the Greeks were both planting cover crops in between the rows of their vineyards. They would use, they would use things like um, legumes like uh, clovers and stuff to enhance, enhance the vineyards, grow better, healthier grapes. Back in the mid-1800s, then, as the westward expansion was happening, that's all the pioneers had to, once they broke the prairie soils out, and even here in Kansas in the late 1800s, um, there was extensive use of, of cover crops. I know that my grandfather talked about the green manure, or the plow down, what they used to do back before World War II. They would plant, plant either a summer or a winter lagoon primarily to turn it back into the soil to enhance the soil with, with what they had then. So, what, so what's changed? So what's changed was shortly after World War II that there was a system that was, that was invented and started to be used called the Haber-Bosch system that would take natural gas and that we could synthetically make nitrogen fertilizers. And it was great we get immediate responses from plants by using the synthetic nitrogen that was created then. Shortly after that, we started getting some synthetic chemicals that we were able to use, such as atrazine in the 60s, that was able to, to keep our fields clean, keep the weeds out of it. Mid-90s was the introduction of GMOs, or genetically modified organisms. We were able to plant a soybean field go out there after the weeds were coming up and hit it with 32 ounces of a four pound glyphosate and keep the fields clean. But something's changed. There may have been some unintended consequences that we never really realized, such as, such as what were we doing to the soil microbiome or what were we doing to the microbes within the soil and how is that affecting everything else? When we talk about farming, we're talking about a biological system. We're talking about a biological system that has been in place ever since the creation of Earth. Um, we also have seen that our, our chemical inputs, um, all of our inputs have gone up in price, and, but not necessarily our net profitability. And with cover crops, we're be being able to do some of that kind of stuff, bring back some profitability and reduce some input costs. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my story and how I got so passionate about cover crops and soil health in general. And that was, that was before I was working for Kaufman Seeds, I went there one day to pick up some seed wheat. I had ordered some seed wheat planted, to plant it early in order to graze. And when I went there, Dustin Miller, one of the owners, told me, he said, well now Darren, why don't you buy a couple pounds of radishes to put in with your seed wheat? I said, why in the world would I spend money on radishes to put in with my wheat? Well, he said a key word because I'm a cattle guy. He said, more forage. I was like, all right, I'm in. He said, oh, and by the way, we're seeing a yield increase in the wheat, anywhere from zero bushels to acre, all the way up to 10 to 12 bushels to the acre. Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We 
predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas, we work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well in their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but yet we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is suretcropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at suretcropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'd be glad to answer and work with you. This segment brought to you by Kansas Wheat. Learn more at rediscoverwheat.org. I thought, okay, well, my primary focus is cattle, but if there's a chance of a yield increase plus more forage, I'm all in. So I took those radish seeds home then, I planted that field that year, and he was right. I did produce more forage. I had more grazable forage out there for my cattle, so I was hooked with there. But what was really interesting was that winter, I went back out there, the ground was frozen, oh, a half quarter inch deep, something like that, and I took my ax that I carried to chop ice, and I, and I cut out about a one foot square around this radish root. I wanted to see what the radish root was doing. Of course, it was planted in a row with the wheat. So I took the shovel and I got as big a scoop full out as I can and I started breaking apart the dirt. I wanted to see what was in there. And what I was, I was completely fascinated with the fact that that wheat root was wrapped around that radish and following it down into the ground. So from there I knew, I didn't know what was going on, but I knew that there was some kind of a relationship. There was something happening between the two different species. I had the radish as a brassica, I had the wheat as a grass, but yet the wheat was feeding off of that, off of that radish root for some reason. I couldn't explain it. And honestly, I still don't know today what it, what it is. Um, we went ahead and cut the field of wheat, but I had planted the whole thing to radishes and wheat combo, so I don't know if I had a yield increase or not, but that wasn't the point. The point was that I found out that there's something to the plants working together and I was fascinated by it. So that following summer then, I had heard of some guys planting some sedans and cow peas together. And I thought, okay, uh, normally I just plant sedan grass, put down a chemical to keep the weeds out, fertilize it with as much nitrogen as I thought that I had moisture for, and, and we raised the sedan crop mostly to graze, but, but um, some we would bale some, some years. Anyway, so, we, so I, I started introducing some legumes into my sorghum sedan and I was fascinated by the fact that, that not only would the legumes work together with that grass, I was able to, number one, eliminate all chemicals. Um, whatever I'd put out there would probably kill my cover crop or my multi-species crop that I had growing out there. Um, number two, I had an increase in insects. Most of you think that that'd be bad, but it wasn't. It wasn't necessarily attracting bad insects. It was attracting a whole bunch of insects in there. Hi, I'm Kim Mandarin with Hardy Insurance. I'm here to help you with all of your farm and ranch needs. When it comes to protecting your operation and your family, you need a name you can trust at a price you can afford. Call me today or visit hardyaviationins.com. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. As fourth generation farmers themselves, Heinen Brothers Ag Service understands the risk and rewards of farming. So when it comes to quality aerial and ground application, fertilizer, ag chemicals, and anhydrous ammonia, call Heinen Brothers Ag today, 800-760-4964. This segment brought to you by SureCrop, liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. So uh, a couple years ago when we had the sugarcane aphid was a really, really bad in here in Reno County. I, uh, I had some come into my, my sorghum sedan cover crop blend, but you know what? It didn't, it didn't affect them because I had such an explosion of ladybugs and lacewings in there that were attracted to them 
they were just having a field day feeding on all those sugarcane aphids in there. Ladybug larvae were everywhere and they were just, they were just exploding. Bottom line is I didn't have to spend any money on additional insecticides to control the sugarcane aphids. I had the ladybugs there to do it for myself. I was still missing something though because I noticed that I still had what I call slabby soils. So I'm blessed to have very, very productive, good farm ground. It's a sandy loam soil here in Reno County. Um, but I would, get, I would get this layering effect. I would get this layering effect in my soils whenever I would take a shovel full of dirt out there. I had these layers. So I knew that my water infiltration rate was not good. I want to be able to capture every drop of rain that I possibly can and keep it on my farm instead of letting it wash down the ditch into the creek and on downstream where it could cause more trouble. So, so I didn't know what I was doing wrong for sure and my brother who I'm in partnership with on the cattle, he's not into the whole cover crop thing as much as I am, but he told me one day, he said, well dummy, you're just not leaving anything out there. And as a cattle guy, he was right. If there's a green blade of grass, I was going after it. I wanted that to put it back into, into the cattle feed. So, so we started leaving more residue after that. Um, as an example, one year, I had 10 foot tall sedan. We were blessed with rain that summer. I didn't need the forage. And so we made the decision. I, I hired my neighbor to come in with a really good no-till drill. And we just drilled a winter cover crop into 10 foot tall standing sedan. Just knocked it over as we go. going. I didn't spray it to kill it. I didn't roll it. I just did nothing but drive over it and put the drill over it, chopped it up at the drill the best we could, and we planted right into it. The bottom line was the next spring already, six months later, I could see a difference in my soils. My soils still had some of the slabby effect to it, but it was getting really, it was getting better really, really fast. It's amazing how fast some of this stuff can turn around when you start working with na nature. I, I attribute that to two things. I attribute it to a multi-species, having multiple different things out there, brassicas, legumes, grasses, as well as leaving plenty of residue there. We have to be just as concerned about feeding the underground livestock that we can't see as we do about the above ground livestock. And so we can really turn our, our soils around to hurry if, if we want to. We need to look at cover crops as more than just feed. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. Next time you see a beautiful field of corn, reach out and thank the farmers who work tirelessly to raise corn for livestock feed, renewable fuels, and exports to feed a growing world population. The farmers on the Kansas Corn Commission work for Kansas Corn with grower-funded checkoff dollars that support foreign and domestic market development, research, promotion, and education to expand opportunities for Kansas farmers. To learn more, visit kscorn.com. I dug trees by hand for years and years and years. In the process, I wore out my rotary cuff. But when I learned about this, process, I thought if there was a way to get rid of this pain, then I, then I wanted to do it. So we did it and it worked. I'm not going to go out and dig trees and shovel anymore, but, but I can do the things that I want to do now. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. So one of the biggest objections I get whenever I'm talking to somebody about putting together a cover crop mix is the water. And in Kansas, we all know how important it is to have, to keep as much water as we possibly can. Well, I didn't have my brain wrapped around the whole keeping the water concept because I knew that I was using water to grow that cover crop. But I met a guy from Western Oklahoma by the name of Jimmy Emmons. And if any of you guys ever get the chance to go hear Jimmy Emmons speak, he does a fabulous job. He's just as common as everybody. I just, he's a Western Oklahoma cowboy who has really gotten onto this and understands it and is able to convey the message extremely well. 
he's a friend and I just love to be around him and, and grab onto some of his insight. So what Jimmy did was he took some moisture probes. He would take moisture probes, put it into a grow in, into his cover crop, growing cover crop, put one outside, right side by side, but it was outside the cover crop. And he would see a moisture deficit in the growing cover crop as it was growing. But after that crop was terminated and, and the next cash crop was planted into it, all of a sudden we started to see the reverse. We started every rain event, I don't care if it was only a tenth of an inch, he would start to see the moisture levels in his soils come up for several different reasons. But, but one of those reasons is we kept the ground covered. He kept it cool. He didn't have the evaporation or the heat that we do normally if we have bare dirt out there. So he understood that he was going to use some moisture to grow it, but he would capture more in the end on the subsequent cash crop. And I thought, you know what? If this cowboy from Western Oklahoma can do it in a hotter and drier climate than what I am, there is no reason that I can't do the same, same thing here. So he really changed my mind on that. The other objection I get is the cost. You know, I talk about reducing inputs. We got to cut back on our chemicals and cut back on our fertilizers. When we put some fertilizer out there, do we just do it blindly? Or, or is there a reason that we're putting certain levels? Same way with chemicals. The chemicals that we're putting out there, is there really justification for that? Or are we doing it just to make us feel good on it? Um, cover crops are an expense, there's no doubt about it. I mean, we're putting together blends for, depending on the goals of the farmer, anywhere from 20 to $30 an acre for a cover crop blend. And yeah, that's an expense, that's a real expense that um, I tell everybody, say, listen, use livestock to capture that expense. You don't look at it as making a profit off of that, off of that cover crop from grazing, but use it as a way to get your money back, if you will. And if you don't have livestock into your operation, that's fine. I guarantee you that a neighbor does, or I guarantee you that some young guy just starting out is looking for an opportunity. Work with your neighbors. Find somebody willing to graze that and get your money back from, from that kind of thing. Tarwater Farm and Home is a 40-year-old local family-owned business. Clothing for work and play, seeds and feeds, boots, toys for the kids, and tools you'll need for around the house and farm. And a service department to keep them in top running order. It's a big store, so take some time to see what they have for your farm and home. Tarwater's everyday pricing is like others' sale prices. When you need it, they've got it. Tarwater Farm and Home, 4107 North Topeka Boulevard. The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan is rediscovering ways to get improved varieties and new genetics in the hands of farmers faster. Grower-led and checkoff-funded research initiatives are bringing about positive change. This grassroots leadership provides a strong voice in Topeka and Washington, D.C. Now is the time to partner with Kansas Wheat in moving wheat forward. Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, farmers investing in their future and yours. Log on to rediscoverwheat.org. Next time you see a beautiful field of corn, reach out and thank the farmers who work tirelessly to raise corn for livestock feed, renewable fuels, and exports to feed a growing world population. The farmers on the Kansas Corn Commission work for Kansas Corn with grower-funded checkoff dollars that support foreign and domestic market development, research, promotion, and education to expand opportunities for Kansas farmers. To learn more, visit kscorn.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Soybean Commission. Progress powered by Kansas farmers. So I touched a little bit earlier on some of the principles. There's really five principles when it comes to cover crops and re what I'll call regenerative ag. Um, the first principle is minimal disturbance. You want to, to not disturb it both chemically and physically reduce the disturbance as much as possible. That means no-till. That means, that means reduced chemical uses. I still use chemicals in my own operation, but I do so very, very sparingly. I try to cut back as much as possible. Number one, I don't want the expense. Number two, I don't want it to affect 
the soils in a negative, low, negative way. The second one is to keep the ground covered, armor on top of the soil. That's the lesson I learned from the slabby soils when I didn't have any residue on the top. Keep residue on top of the soils, keep the ground covered. Number three is, is energize the whole system with diversity. Diversity is really key in this whole thing. You have the radish and wheat example that I talked about earlier, but using legumes to help supply your, your nitrogen needs, at least part of it, you know, is, is very important. You gotta have that diversity to make the whole system work. Number four is to keep a living root in the ground. If you keep a living root in the ground, 365, what you're doing is you're increasing your organic matter in the soil. You're taking the carbon from the carbon dioxide out of the air and you're pumping it through photosynthesis through your root exudates back into the soil. And, and if you can do that, you're increasing your carbon organic matter uh, naturally by keeping a living root in the ground. If nothing's growing out there, you've got bare dirt, there is no photosynthesis going, going on. Um, the fifth principle, my favorite, is to insert livestock into the equation. You know, our soils here in Kansas were built with large herbivores. We had the buffalo, the elk, the, the antelope, deer. They all were working together with our native plants to build our soils up. Um, there's some kind of relationship going on between plants and livestock that I can't explain. I've had a lot of guys try to explain it. That's just one thing that I haven't got my head around yet. But it's very, very important. I know that we need livestock into the equation, if nothing else, to recycle the nutrients. So, so when I would go out into my fields, I could dig up an earthworm about every shovel full or at least every other shovel full. But underneath that cow pie, I could literally dig up 25 to 30 earthworms. They were all there recycling that manure and taking it back into the soil. I think it's more than just spreading manure out there. It has something to do with hoof action, saliva uh, affecting the plant when the cow bites it. It's, it's, it's a more complicated system that we all don't have the answers to yet than just putting manure out there, even though putting manure out there is, is very, very good. Um, in conclusion, I'll talk about are cover crops right for you? Are cover crops right for your operation? Well, it all depends. It's not right for everybody to be using cover crops. I'll tell you, there's a lot of guys I know that I'll tell them, listen, don't, don't spend your money here. I think you have to incorporate it and look at it as a whole or a whole system to this thing. It's not just one thing. Cover crops are a tool. In my opinion, they're a very, very valuable tool we need to be using, but it's just like you would try to uh, pound a nail into wood with a saw, you'd want to use a hammer. It's the same thing with cover crops. It's the right tool at the right time in the right situation. And so, and so it's not gonna work for everyone. Another thing is your attitude on it. You know, do you think the cover crop's gonna fail if you do and think it's a waste of money before you even start? Man, don't start because it will be a failure to it, I guarantee it. A lot of it has to do with your attitude and what you really want, what's your goals. Do you want to really improve your soil health you want to improve your water infiltration rate, your nutrient cycling and all that. If you do, they'll work for you. You know, some, a lot of people say, well, it won't work here. I know here in Kansas that it'll work all the way from St. Francis to Baxter Springs and from Hiawatha to Elkhart. It'll work. Everybody that wants to make it work has been making it work no matter what the environment. So it's all about biomimicry. Biomimicry is a term that I picked up from a friend of mine, Ray Archuleta, who talks about mimicking what nature has given us. If you go into a native pasture, you look at the diversity that's out there. That's what we're trying to mimic. If you go to a woodland in, in eastern Kansas, there's so much diversity, we want to try to mimic what's going on there to help us. There's no set recipe for this, but if you start working with nature and do the biomimicry thing, it will pay, pay well for you. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com.